Oh, that's I did the. Um... It is my distinct privilege to introduce Amanda Clark, who is a St. Louis, a public historian of St. Louis from the colonial era to the present extraordinaire. Um, if you've ever had an opportunity to be on one of the many tours of this region that she's led, you know that she is brilliant. She is also the co-owner of a new bookstore that's opening up, the Leviathan that's going to be on South Grand. So for those of you in St. Louis, be sure and check it out. But she is going to be speaking to us tonight on um, Women at the Edges of Empire, um, uh, or on the edges of empire, women in colonial St. Louis. And so I am going to turn it over to her and thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. And hello, everybody. Um, I haven't done one of these in a while. It feels very, um, it was, yeah, it's like hopping on a bike and doing these, these talking. Um, so yeah, welcome. We're going to, let me share my screen real quick and we'll get to that part. There we go. And share. Can someone confirm you can see my my screen? All right. It looks great. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, all right. So yeah. So my name is Amanda Clark. I live in St. Louis. I am not from St. Louis, though. That's that's an important thing. Um, I think for those of us that share our local history and share the history of a place, you know, to acknowledge that this is uh, not a place I'm from, right? So this is a history that I have uh, learned, a history I've fallen in love with, um, and definitely not one that I expected uh, to know a lot about. I moved to St. Louis 20 years ago with a history degree all about Byzantine art. So sometime, sometime you'll have to hang out with me and I'll tell you how, how I got from Byzantine art to the edges of learning about colonial St. Louis and getting to talk about that for a job. Uh, so this, you know, I'm a, what we call a generalist, right? So I get to talk about all kinds of different topics about St. Louis. And I really love the chance, though, to dive into this period of St. Louis history. I think that it um, often gets boiled down into Lewis and Clark, right? Or the, sh the fur trade. And we're not going to talk about any of those guys or any of those things today. They might, might get a, a minor mention. But we're going to talk about how, you know, the the switching all the different hands that were controlling St. Louis in a in a in a in that during that colonial period during that the late um the late 1700s like all those different shifts and changes and how they affected uh women's lives and of course they did not affect them across the board the exact same because everybody's having different experiences and and so I've chosen a couple of examples that we'll do in the second half of the webinar that will cover some kind of examples of, of some of these things that we talked about so I do have to provide context first, though, because we're going to be talking about uh, Louisiana Purchase, hopefully in a way that uh, is fun, because Louisiana Purchase can be kind of, you know, like I said, it's always Lewis and Clark, and that's the story, and and Napoleon and all the things. So we're going to talk more about what did the Louisiana Purchase mean in St. Louis, and this is really important to the, the bigger topic at hand today. It's because St. Louis has some really unique complexities that other places during this period are not, uh, are, we're unique here. We've got some things that make our history history unique. And it also makes the complexities of modern St. Louis unique. Like if I give, one of the bus tours that I give regularly is called the Del Mar Divide. And we talk about, uh, you know, these different, you know, the history of division, racial division, socioeconomic division, all of these things in St. Louis. And all of them start with this story right here. And, and you'll see why um, all of this is woven in to modern St. Louis and challenges that we have. Um, I just want to also acknowledge that since we will be dealing with the colonial era, I am doing that with the understanding and the acknowledgement that, uh, you know, phrases like belonging to and government of and things like that were very, are problematic, can be problematic, and I hope we will, um, can handle that um, correctly. But this is, you know, this is a place where people you know, not just that, you know, indigenous groups have lived here for a long time, such as the Osage Nation, the Missouri, the Illini Confederacy, all these different groups. St. Louis is also unique in that we were a place where large concentrations of people lived uh, during other periods of time. And I'm referring to the Cahokia Mounds site as the uh, physical reminder uh, in the built environment of larger um, civilizations that were in this area before European arrival. 
So St. Louis as a village founded in 1764, and I will acknowledge my weird map that I've got here on, this, on the screen here in a moment. Um, it's founded in 1764 by a group of French merchants, and they were looking for a really great spot to put a trading post um, and a trading post that would kind of open up right the, to larger areas. Um, they found it on top of a 30-foot tall bluff uh, hanging out above the Mississippi River with a bigger, higher plateau behind it that you could that could allow for safety and protection. Um, this is the place where the arch is right now. And so these folks, they find this great spot, 1764. They decide this is where we're going to put this trading post. Um, on the map here, I'm going to show, whoop, we're going to do a little, uh, that shows where St. Louis is. So this, the map that I have on the um, on the screen right now has French settlements, British settlements. Uh, we are not either of those things at that time, um, which we'll talk about in a moment. So we're founded in 1764. Um, we didn't know that you know, the men that and the people that founded St. Louis, their money was from France. They're backing you know, the people that were investing in them. And uh, they left out from New Orleans thinking that they were in French colonial territory. Um, they found out not too long after that they were not because um, France had already ceded all land west of the Mississippi to Spain and land east of the Mississippi to Britain. So this is a this is a great spot up on a bluff. It's also a really precarious spot um, because they're now staring across the river at a territory under new control and influenced by very different social norms. And so this is going to, well, you know, this is all, this is the things that are brewing here in St. Louis as they're creating a village. This is where that edge of empire comes in. We're literally the border city between these two, um, these two things that are happening. So you have people that are populating St. Louis from all over. They're coming from France and from Canada, and they're moving from different places, Creole French, Canadian French, enslaved Africans. We have free Africans living in, in early St. Louis. Um, we have um, American enslaved American Indians and free American Indians living here. So we have all these people that are living in different circumstances coming together in one place. Um, and they all come from, when it comes to our topic today and talking about women, they're all coming from different gender norms, meaning they're not all coming from the same kind of expectations of women's roles in societies, right? So there's a whole mix of things. And, and some of the indigenous groups, right, where women are in, um, you have matriarchal power in those groups. And we have, um, and we're going to talk more about the, the French and the Spanish and the British and how all that mixes up. But so everyone's coming together from different places, and they're all living in this one, one place. So we have this unique geography. We're right on the river, right in this natural line uh, that's going to define St. Louis for a long time, this natural border. And so everyone's coming together to create a society where everybody has unique power and agency in far greater numbers than the societies that are being, um, that are taking hold on the, on the, in the East, in the Eastern part of the United States. So in 1802, so they founded the village in 1764. All these people are coming here. They find out they're in colonial Spain, not colonial France. Um, 1802, Napoleon Bonaparte forces Spain to hand Louisiana back to France in a secret treaty. Again, St. Louis is now sitting right on the edge of, empire, of empires. Uh, about a year later, Louisiana Purchase happens. France sells to the U.S., uh, putting St. Louis as the gateway to the new American territory. Um, and a point that always kind of drives that home to me of us being an edge is Lewis and Clark when they do come to St. Louis to leave out on their famous on their on their uh, military expedition they needed French interpreters with them to speak to the leaders here in St. Louis like they it's just kind of an interesting illustration of cultural cultural differences there so Americans don't officially take control of St. Louis until 1804 because it takes about a year for the news to make its way to St. Louis and for Spain to officially give it back. Um, all those layers of social complexity are gonna be at play in the public and private lives of women living in St. Louis. And just as a side note, I am not watching the chat, but I'm happy to um, check it from time to time if anyone has a question. Um, if, if, there seems, if there's a pertinent question to what I'm talking about, if you see it in there, happy to stop and answer it. And then we'll definitely do Q and A at the end. So the images here that this is Three Flags Day. This is the day that um, we have. We just have these paintings because you know, no, 
that's what we just have paid. There's interpretations of this. Um, Three Flags Day happens in 1804 when they officially hand everything over. And it's the symbolic culmination of the Louisiana Purchase. It's held on March 9th, just under a year after the initial thing happens. Um, and so they suddenly, in, in 24 hours, they need to go from Spain to France to the United States. Um, and so they do this in a series of flag raisings and you know, signings of papers and all of that kind of stuff. So this is a pretty important day culturally in, or in St. Louis's cultural history because this is all still pretty new to the people living in St. Louis and they've been building for the you know, last 30 years. They've been building a village and a group and a society that is different than the ones across, like the group across the river. Different laws are in place. Um, if you are, you know, depending on if you're a woman or if you're uh, Free, per, uh, free person of color or enslaved person, but like all these laws are just within this river, they're different on both sides. Um, and so they have this ceremony, they raise the French flag, it's supposed to only be up for a couple of hours, instead the city, the village starts singing, starts partying, it lasts all through the night, they really send that French flag off, and then they raise the American flag to almost near silence, because they know they know what it means, right? They know that, that this is a really, really big deal um, and this big change that's about to happen. So we're talking in, the, in our talk today about the colonial St. Louis um, and women. We're talking about the period, the mid 1760s to the years just following the Louisiana Purchase. So that transition from French trading posts ruled by Spain, interacting with native cultures to a newly American city. Uh, that place would be grass, you know, grasping with rapid growth, rapid growth and change under a government that is powered by manifest destiny, which wasn't wasn't the energy beforehand, right? And so that's going to come into play with that Louisiana Purchase as well. Um, and from the beginning, like I said, we had all these different things. We had different an influx of different. Uh, There's really fluid government here before prior to the Louisiana Purchase. They were kind of I don't say making it up as they go, but there was just Things were shifting and changing and not a lot of the laws were written down and they were kind of doing what worked best right for the village and kind of working underneath their own set of set of rules and this is going to be important um and that and because of all of this villagers in st louis develop a, uncommon views of women and and of for the time because women in the, this time period of st louis have a lot of have a lot of agency not as a whole but um in general, they're going. They are experiencing a lot more agency and control of their of their. They're able to have you know land in their own name and sell and trade and and, and they're going to have a a much more active part in the building of the village um, than is the normal expectation for women's experiences. Um, and the views are reflected in how they came to be here, how they spent their days, how they appear in the legal records. We're going to cover that and how much control they had over their own lives. And they're able to, also because of that diversity, there are new cultural norms that are established here in St. Louis. So hopefully all of this kind of sets up the stage of the, the diversity of, of things, of, of norms, of challenges to norms, of the, you know, people bringing uh, their different, uh, you know, just bringing their different cultures to one place and living on the edge of a different one. The image I have on the screen right now, um, if anyone is ever teaching, you know, history of St. Louis is a really great image uh, map to use because it shows just how um, how very different the terrain is now than from St. Louis. We have forts around the outside of the, where the villages that were Spanish forts, and um, we've got islands out in the Mississippi that people lived on, and so there's a lot of like going on. This is a really great resource of a map. So these particular images, these were um, these are also very special to St. Louis. They were images drawn by a colonial era artist in St. Louis, a woman by the name of Anna Maria von Fol, and she they're going to hang out on the screen as a backdrop for setting up the story, for continuing to set up the story of women in colonial St. Louis. Uh, Anna Maria came here uh, as a young woman. She lived in Kentucky. She was educated. Uh, she comes into St. Louis. She has family members that are living here, and so she, her images. Her paintings of colonial St. Louis are only firsthand uh, serve as, as our main like firsthand knowledge of what people wore in colonial St. Louis, what uh, people were coming and going. They're, they're really an important piece of the historic record. 
So in the early days of the village, men outnumbered women five to one. That's in 1764. By 1794, that was two to one. Um, the economy was based on trade and merchandise, not agriculture. That's important. Uh, free women, mostly Creole, and that's including uh, free women of color as well as white women. They were more likely to be the wives and daughters of merchants, traders, and craftsmen, not farmers. Um, they normally did marry quite young to men that were much older, and they often married many times. Uh, they were their infant mortality rate was about thirty percent, but and there was a high pregnancy rate because people were trying to you know, populate this place. Um, almost half of the colonial population was white, uh, with the rest being free and enslaved Indians, Africans, and those of mixed races. Um, some female slaves worked in. Uh, enslaved women worked the common field, which was the farming area for the village, but most women's lives centered on village life and not that uh, the common field. And so during this time of town building, you know, women's ability to make homes and babies to fill them were, was really important. And so women of all statuses and all economic levels had a lot in common. They were they all kind of had the same goal and their domestic work would have looked really similar because of this town building and this, this period of time. Unlike the 19th century and on, uh, in more modern times, race was not the main determinant of status during this time, this colonial period in St. Louis. Um, if you were a, an enslaved African, you did have the fewest legal rights, but free people of all races had almost all of the same legal rights. Um, the, the dominant delineation, delineation uh, that's a hard phrase, dominant delineation, uh, were social and economic status. So that's really more at play than race during this time period in St. Louis. This is not a blanket term for everywhere in St. Louis. Um, all free women in this Creole society, um, in, com in comparison to those on the East Coast, had many more options when it came to property rights and financial mobility. When they married, this is really important. And on the screen right now, I have two, the two faces, the two um, profiles were done by the artist Anna Maria von Foll. And the document on the right is a marriage contract. And so this is something that is found you know, in, in Creole society in, during this time period. This is something really unique and important that's going on then. And so when people got married, they would sign these marriage contracts that detailed what assets both the husband and wife brought to the marriage. And when the husband dies, the wife inherits all of the marital property. When both parents die, tragically, both, if both parents are dead, sons and daughters inherit equally. So that's very different um, than what's going on elsewhere. Uh, this was part of the French laws and the Spanish allowed them to maintain this transition. So it's an example of how that fluidity of government and culture is all kind of stewing here. Um, within a marriage though, a uh, husband did hold legal control over, over his wife. So it's not, I don't want to make it too rosy of a thing there. Um, but at the same time, in the Eastern colonies, so in the Ameri what would become the U.S. colonies, they were governed, and the, those that were go originally governed by Britain and then by the U.S., there were laws called curvature, and those affect, that's a very different set of laws than women in colonial St. Louis were, um, were living under. So in the East, uh, those laws said that a woman belonged to her father or her husband, uh, she did not have her own rights in that society, meaning that she couldn't own things like land or handle their own money. Um, of course, there are people that were outliers to this, but we're kind of these are flip things in this situation where the norm in St. Louis is opposite than the norm in the in the in the colonies. And generally, women did not have much say in their financial or civil lives. In St. Louis, though, things are really different. Uh, women in St. Louis were owned could own their own property and they could have power over that property. They could sue people if their property was damaged or if they you know, had debts from another, a woman could go to, could file a, a lawsuit uh, to, to receive something from someone that, that was hers. Um, you know, a lot of the women in St. Louis were here with merchants and fur traders and fur trappers. And those are very transient, uh, transient partners, um, and they were away for long periods of time on hunting trips or trading journeys, and the wives were in charge of the village. Um, they managed the household, they tended the crops, they bought what they needed, they looked after the house, bought more land. We have a lot of great examples in St. Louis 
colonial St. Louis of women um, assembling large parcels of land themselves. Um, they could make business deals. Uh, and free women in St. Louis had the ability to be financially independent and have their own resources. Um, all widows, uh, all free widows had greater freedom and more control over their lives than married women did. Um, wealthy widows enjoyed the highest social status in this colonial uh, time period in St. Louis. And this connects to that French, the, the French part, the French, and we're going to, there's a good quote coming up that kind of speaks to that, but French women had more general independence and were seen as more valuable members of society. Uh, the first, when the United States takes over in St. Louis, we have a civil commander, this guy named Amos Stoddard, and he comes here and he writes you know, all these notes about this wild place of St. Louis. And one of the things that he, a quote that he has is the women here have more influence over their husbands than is common in most other countries. Perhaps this arises in part from the example of the parent state, in part from the respect which the men entertain for their wives, and perhaps still more because of the exclusive right which the women have to the property and consequences of marriage contracts. Even in most instances of purchases and sales, the women are consulted and frequently assume management of property. So he's he's noting this uh, when he's observing life in St. Louis as they're transitioning to uh, to U.S. rule. Women in St. Louis also have a lot of access, interestingly, a lot of access to books. Um, and we know that the majority of free women in St. Louis could read because we have letters that they wrote and we have correspondence. We have legal correspondence when they're suing uh, people. So we have evidence that this was a thing. Um, when St. Louis, the village was only three years from founding, so in 1767, um, the village contained two to 3,000 books. Uh, most of them were, you know, from the Enlightenment. They're, 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 they're sharing knowledge that and ideals that are definitely going to be lending themselves to uh, this different roles for women. So uh, again, this is a marriage contract on the right there in French, if anyone it's, it's beautiful. And if you go to, um, there's some great resources out there for looking at marriage contracts. The Missouri Historical Society has um, a large collection of these that are typed up and translated. So if, if anyone needs access to these, they do exist out there in great numbers. They have an index, they've got, they're translated, um, and those were translated by an early, um, an early curator at the Missouri Historical Society. So of course, most of 99% of what I've just said applies to free women, right? Uh, for enslaved women, life was very different and the coming of American rule has a pretty big impact there as well. Um, again, we're, we're relying on these lovely paintings. Um, these paintings of Colonial St. Louis, as a, as a side note, um, these were done as set drawings. Um, there was a, a huge play that was done in St. Louis in 1914 that was meant to portray this whole big story about colonial St. Louis, and these are set drawings. So it's, it's kind of a, it's a really neat uh, resource to be able to use. So in colonial St. Louis, enslavement of Africans was governed by what was known as the Code Noir, so French slave law. And even when things switch over to Spanish, the actual rules stay pretty much the same. Um, enslavement was here from the very beginning. Uh, 1766, we have the first census showing that a village of over 350 people included 22% uh, of the population was enslaved, both African and American Indians. That's a, that's a really important distinction to, it's going to come up and make in the historic record um, later during the American period. So we have these two different populations that are here as enslaved people. Under Spanish law though, American Indians were not allowed to be enslaved. So the fact that there were a large amount of them here shows how little that this, how little control the Spanish actually had here in St. Louis. Uh, the major, majority of the um, indigenous uh, women that were enslaved, they were actually the result of having been taken prisoner uh, after battles and conflicts um, and then sold to these to the villages. In St. Louis, they're following the Code Noir, but there were a few things that are softened here. Um, slaves were baptized and buried in consecrated ground. That was that was something that was unique to hear. Uh, children were not to be sold away from their parents, um, and enslaved couples were encouraged to be legitimately married. So that is a, a little different culture here. Um, and the Code Noir is, I mean, it is enslavement law. No one is free, and that is the um, the reality of it, but it definitely has this 
a, a, a different um, feel to it than what's going to come when the Americans take over. Um, during the colonial period, enslaved people could gain freedom in three ways. Notarized agreements, so they're, you know, the person who held those enslavement papers could say, I give you the, the freedom. Uh, you could be freed via someone's will when they died. Um, and then later they could actually purchase that freedom. Uh, Self-purchase was a feature of Spanish slave law, not French. So that's an important distinction. And it first happens in New Orleans in 1770. Uh, it happens in St. Louis in 1780. So it's, it's a little late coming, but it is something that is going to come up um, later in our presentation. For women, the ways that they were, that those things like notarized agreements, wills, and purchasing of your freedom, those things came, a lot of times came about because of children that they had with their owners or because of the, uh, or with, you know, that they had with the, the people that were, that were enslaving them or because of the nature of, the, of their relationships. So this is, adds an interesting um, layer to this. Um, indigenous and black women who were freed were immediately able to take part in legal proceedings which is also unique and interesting. Um, there's one example of a black woman named Marguerite, who once she was given her, uh, when she was freed, she marries a hunter, a, a local person lived in St. Louis. Um, she has a you know, legal marriage to this hunter. The two of them move back in with her former owner. They take care of him until he dies and they inherit all of his assets. Um, she's in the legal records representing herself by suing someone, she's suing someone uh, within a year of being married. So it's an, an interesting illustration of how all of this stuff can shift in this culture. All right. So now I have some women I'm going to use as, as examples, which and it was in some levels is always dangerous because it's one person's experience, right? And it's not indicative of everyone, but there are three examples that have some continuity to them that you can draw um, and use um, in discussing um, this time period. So the first woman I'm going to discuss uh, is an example of upward mobility and potential for independence that free Creole women had. Um, if we were talking in person, I would quiz you all and say, do you know who this who this is? Um, she's pretty pretty important in the the narrative that is the, you know, the myth of St. Louis, the, 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 the important narrative. So she's a very serious woman, if you can tell from the painting. Um, her life would make a really, really good movie, I think, at least. Um, she's a complex, very imperfect character that follows her heart. She refuses to accept circumstances that are given to her, and she creates a life that would shape our country's history, right? It, it writes itself. Um, this is Marie Chouteau. Um, we'll call her Madame Chouteau, because that's what the... Uh, in the historic record, that's what we uh, St. Louis historians you know, use. For 50 years, uh, Madame Chateau lived in the very center of St. Louis, literally. Um, she lived in the village's largest home. She enjoyed the highest social status. She traded furs on her own. She owned a plantation. She owned properties throughout the area. She also enslaved several people, both African and Indian. Um, but before all that, she was an abandoned single mother living in colonial New Orleans. Uh, she was born in 1733, and she was married when... It, so she's born in 1733 in New Orleans. She is married uh, when she's 15. She's married for about a year, and this in her marriage, the legal record shows uh, evidence of abuse. She has a baby with her husband. Um, the baby's name is Auguste Chouteau. She separates from her husband. Um, in 1752, he leaves the two of them in New Orleans and returns to France. Um, not too long after that, she does two very smart things. One, she starts calling herself Veuve Chateau, so or Widow Chateau. Um, here she is taking, by doing that, she's taking direct advantage of French laws pertaining to social status and financial agency, a widow. So she knows about, you know, she knows her society, she knows where she is. Um, and she she's taking you know, she's taking, I don't want to say, she's taking her destiny in her own hand. That sounds, that sounds dumb. But like she, in some way, she's saying, okay, in this society where I live, if I'm a widow, I'm a little safer. I can keep custody of my child. I've got a little higher social status. Um, and she also knows that laws, you know, that during their, during this time period, it's not really clear what the laws are and who's in control. So someone can take, take advantage in a good way of this fluidity. So she, uh, so she becomes, that's her first smart thing. She becomes the widow Chuteau, knowing full well her husband is uh, most likely alive, that he's not at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and then she meets uh, she meets a man named Pierre Laclede, um, and he's a Frenchman. And despite the fact they can't get married, right, even though she's the widow Chuteau, uh, 
he's an honor secret. She cannot get married. Um, and they not only start a family of their, their own. So, right. So the widow Chateau has four magical children. Um, after her husband leaves, her original husband leaves the United States, we have records of him getting on a boat. We have records of him arriving in France. After that time, four magical children are born. Um, those four children are all baptized in the name of their absent of her absent husband. So Pierre Laclede being in on all of this, um, on, he goes along with it, right? So they, they baptize the children as chateaus. So if you're familiar with St. Louis history and you're familiar with the chateau name and how big a role it plays, um, just in the stories of St. Louis and in the history of the country, um, they're Laclede's other than Auguste Chateau. So that's a very interesting complication there. Um, so they start their own family, they baptize all the children and her status as widow is protected, even though these magical children are, are showing up. Um, then she settles with Pierre in St. Louis. So he comes and founds the village. He brings August, who by that time was 12, 13 years old. Um, he brings August to Pierre to St. Louis. They settle the village. When she shows up with the other four kids, including the, the baby, when she gets, when Madame Chateau arrives in St. Louis, she has a little baby in her, a newborn um, whose name was Victoire. So Victory um, was the name of the, the youngest daughter. Um, so once once Marie Chateau gets to St. Louis, she starts owning, like she starts amassing property of her own um, because she is such good friends with Pierre Laclede, the founder of the village. She has a very high social status. Um, she's always called the widow Chateau. Her legal husband shows back up in St. Louis in 1767. Um, but by that time, even though he's standing right there, her status is high enough that she's able to convince the Spanish lieutenant governor that she's effectively an independent widow. So I, I kind of would love to be a fly on the wall of that, how that went down. Um, when her husband does does die, um, which means she could legally marry Laclede, she doesn't. Um, by that time, he had amassed a lot of debt. She had not. He's amassed a lot of debt. He would have brought that to the marriage because of that marriage contract, how that worked. Uh, when he dies, that all dies with him. Um, and she is left completely financially independent. Um, and of course, that financial independence in includes uh, the work of enslaved workers. And so there's this, this complexity to the story. And when she dies in 1814, she has 50 grandchildren living within a mile of her home. Um, and all of her children marry into wealthy, all of her daughters marry into wealthy merchant families and her sons. Um, her sons would actually all have multiple wives at the same time. They would all have, they would have French wives as well as uh, indigenous wives that were connected to tribes that the group was, the city was, uh, trading with a lot of complexity there and speaking to uh, the experience of um, indigenous women in, in this area in colonial St. Louis as well. So the next woman that I'm going to highlight is Esther. And if anyone has ever been to Laclede's Landing in St. Louis, um, maybe you went there for Mississippi Nights to see a show, or maybe you went like me to Old Spaghetti Factory in the 1990s on a Girl Scout trip. But if you've been to Laclede's Landing, you are physically situated in the home of Esther and where she lives. So Esther, uh, she represents the experience of a formerly enslaved woman who was given their freedom and she uses that freedom to gain agency. So for her story, the, the, the setup. Um, so it's not uncommon, it's not uncommon whatsoever for women of color to own property in colonial St. Louis. Uh, many of them were formerly enslaved or the daughters of enslaved people. And there are several reasons for that. Uh, this is the opposite, totally opposite to experiences of women in British and American territories. Uh, first, the Spanish were eager, eager to settle the land. So they granted land regardless of race or sex. Um, society in St. Louis was so mixed racially. Uh, it, it's so mixed racially, it just became, it was more tolerant than that of the Eastern of the colonies that were not not so diverse. Um, for the women in St. Louis, that ability to own property offers financial stability and collateral, meaning they could bring income to a marriage. They can bring income in. So they bring income in by farming the land. Uh, so they, they can bring, they can make money even if they have no, if they're not married. They can purchase their freedom, have land. They can make money with that land, buy more land. Um, they can host boarders in their house. They can take in laundry. They can do stuff with this, right? Um, and it raises their social status. Um, in colonial St. Louis, if you owned a lot of land, like 
I don't mean like a lot, like a whole bunch. I mean like a lot of land, a plot, I guess. If you owned that, you were also given a piece of the common field. So to be used for farming. And for a majority of these formerly enslaved women who had experience, had more experience with farming than women of the merchant class did, it actually for some, several of them were actually able to use that in a way that um, meant they could farm more, like they were able to turn a higher profit and use this to their advantage. And it's an interesting, interesting scenario to think about. Um, but it was not, an, it's not an uncommon one. And um, it was not the norm. It's not normal, but it was, so there's some place in between, between it's not uncommon, and it's also not normal. Um, a lot of that property was not officially recorded. Uh, when the Americans take over, Many of those women had a had an immediate challenge. So think of this: they own land. No matter who you are, if you're a man, woman, free, and you have land, the day before the Louisiana Purchase comes to St. Louis, the day afterwards, that is questioned. That is immediately up in the air because the Americans show up and they look at every single claim, and some of them are they decided it's not real, it's not true, and and so people lose. You know, they lose their land. They lose that whole. They lose. It's a. It's a really interesting, beyond right, Lewis. I want to say. Be, I could also title this beyond Lewis and Clark, um, beyond this thing of uh, the normal narratives that we the circle around the, the Louise and purchase. This is a very real and immediate issue that's affecting people. So many of these women have immediate challenges to face in maintaining ownership of that land. There are records of several Black women that held impressive, like large amounts of real estate within the village. Um, one of them is Madame Pelagie Rutger. If you're, um, great records of her uh, life and impact on St. Louis. Um, there's a great book called The Colored Aristocracy of St. Louis. That's a really great source for learning about the experience of uh, both free women of color, as well as formerly enslaved women in colonial St. Louis. So there's records you know, of these women holding large amounts of land, having estates, um, but for the most part, African-American women and African women in, in colonial St. Louis were poor, properly, they did not have property, and they were most likely enslaved. Um, free women of color were part of an elite social group. So the document that is on the left is um, pretty, an incredible document in the in the collections of the Missouri Historical Society. And it is a record of the timeline and the life of a woman named Esther Clay Morgan. Esther is considered to be the most successful of the women of, of the women of color who owned property. She's uh she holds a really high high spot in that in that story. She was born enslaved, but she was purchased to settle a debt by a man named Jacques Clay Morgan. That the reason I have Clay Morgan Alley there on the screen is that is an alley in Laclede's Landing. So this is all going to come together here in a second. Um, she becomes, so she's purchased to settle a debt. She becomes Clay Morgan's mistress and a business partner of sorts. Um, he's a very colorful character. He's got a lot going on. Um, he's a man, he has massive amounts of land, numerous business ventures all over the place, and he's always traveling, and he always, has several mistresses, several wives. There's a lot to his story. Um, but when he wasn't in St. Louis, he she has control. He's given her complete control of the home and the business matters. So he trusts her with this, um, even though she is um, one of the people enslaved in his household. So in 1793, Clay Morgan decides to protect a chunk of his assets uh, because he's in trouble. Uh, he's going to get it taken by debtors. Uh, um, and he decides to protect a chunk of this by giving Esther her freedom and then putting a bunch of that real estate in her name and sign, sign it over to her. Uh, this included an entire city block in today's Laclede's Landing. Um, in doing that, he also sells, uh, this is the verb used, sells her her own daughter and also provided money for Esther's grandson. So there's an interesting complexity there. Uh, eventually, though, uh, Clay Morgan begins having a really public romantic affair, and right, she's supposed to be in this role for him. Uh, he has a he starts having this public relationship. Esther begins to look around and see what she needs to do to protect herself because she's seen this pattern that he has lived in. She leaves him and takes the deeds with her. And he, you know, these deeds that he said he was just using her. So he's like, 
he's his she calls his bluff i guess is the way to say like he didn't want her to know like what these deeds were about so um so but she leaves she takes the deeds with her and they they stay in her ownership and the the spanish government when when clay morgan appeals the spanish government they upheld esther's claim to the right to the properties but when the americans take over clay morgan is able to take advantage of the legal changes and the general upheaval and all of this. Um, the Americans do not uphold her property rights in the same way the Spanish did. Uh, they required proof of 10 years of ownership to certify Spanish land claims. Um, Jacques Clay Morgan is able to forge the needed documents, threatens to take back possession of Esther's daughter, alters the paper. Um, Esther fights him in court for 29 years. She fights him until he dies. Um, in the end, she's able to hold on to her home and one of the uh, one of the real estate tracks. And when her descendants are able to make a huge profit um, on that land when she dies, because by the time she dies, you know this is really close to the city center. It's a lot of value. So it's a really, really intriguing story of of one woman's journey through these different um, experiences. So the next scenario, the last example I'm going to use, brings those two things together, kind of brings uh, brings a lot of this into one experience. And this is the story of the Scipion sisters. This is S-C-Y-P-I-O-N. Um, and I use this this image here because the Scipion, Scipion sister's mother, Marie, lived in the home of Pierre Chouteau. Uh, and he factored in heavily with their lives. So this is the house that Pierre Chouteau, one of the founders of St. Louis, lived in. This is, he's important to the story. And we have an actual image of this house. So Celeste and Katish, and I, um, this is C-A-T-I-C-H-E, Scipion, they were enslaved Indian African women. Their mother, Marie Jeanne, was a Natchez Indian um, who had been enslaved under French power. And um, so... So I said earlier, Indian, uh, you know, indigenous women were not allowed supposedly to be, were not supposed to be enslaved under Spanish rule. People find their way around this. But this is going to be interesting when the Americans take over. So um, the Marie's daughters, so her, their mother is enslaved, you know, enslavement passes, you know, through. Um, so Marie's daughters were sold away from her, despite that being not supposed to be allowed either. Um, their owner, uh, their enslaver, sells them, sells them to her own daughter. Like the owner is a the enslaver is a woman, and she sells them to her daughter. And so the, again, they eventually they all live together, right? And they're in one house with all these different complex relationships, legal relationships. Um, in 1799, uh, their enslaver attempts to sell them, but his daughters fight it, saying that the two girls had been gifts, and since they were Indian, they couldn't be sold. So see, it's really complicated. Uh, once the Americans take over, though, their owner tries to sell them again. Uh, his his daughters fight it, and they were just, and this time they were saying, we're just trying to keep the people that help help in our house. Uh, they did test it, so they did testify on the women's behalf in court because this all becomes a big legal battle. After the Americans take over, the Scipion sisters sue their owner under the argument that since they were since they were Indian, they were being held illegally because their mother had been enslaved during the French and Spanish regimes and that she should have been freed under the Spanish uh, control. The owner's daughters testifying on their behalf helps and it gives evidence confirming their free status, the fact that the, the daughters were white and they were testifying in support of these black women helps out territorial law. Um, considering, you know, considered a black person's tes testimony against a white person invalid. But here we have the white daughters are, are testifying. The judges agreed with them and freed them, but not their children. Um, however, the former owners did not appreciate this and fought them in court, eventually placing them back in enslavement. 20 years later, new laws made it possible for them to bring their claims up again. And after several appeals, they were eventually given their freedom. So this is an example this example is one set that for later enslaved people who use freedom suits as a means to leave enslavement. So if you are familiar with, you know, freedom suits, 
and your mind immediately goes to Dredd and Harriet Scott. If you're you know, learning about this, teaching about this, sharing the story, going backwards to the Scipion sisters, going back to these precedents that um, connect in these complex ways to just the uniqueness of St. Louis being under, underneath all of these different governments in such a fluid time, uh, that all leads straight to Dredd and Harriet Scott. And that is only one case of, you know, of well over a hundred. And so, and so that's a much bigger story than is usually represented. And if you're in St. Louis, there is a new, if you don't know, there's a new monument to the freedom suits that's at our civil courthouse. And it has the names on the outside of the monument of all the people that brought, um, brought these suits. So those are just a few examples of so many um, of the ways that women's lives were lived during colonial St. Louis and how they changed after the American takeover. Um, really important are those changing of inheritance, Property ownership laws had really profound effects. I mean, if your husband died the day before, right, uh, you inherit everything. If if he dies after American control, that same thing is divided differently. And culturally, uh, the expectations of women are going to weave themselves into the DNA of the early city and into to. There's just these examples. All of this stuff is part of. St. Louis. Right? Um, I hope that, and I hope this kind of helps shed some light on it, um, and those changing governments, the, how this was a unique place physically, and those mixing cultures um, affected women's uh, experiences. Um, and there's an, kind of, a, if anyone's familiar with Kate Chopin, so the late 19th century feminist, considered the first feminist writer, um, and she writes a lot about, a lot of her stories are about freedom and, or women, you know, women in a confined uh, situation, Victor very Victorian, seeking freedom, seeking a control of their own lives and their own stories. Um, Kate Chopin's grandmother was from Creole, St. Louis, right? So, so Kate is raised hearing stories of women that lived in St. Louis during this time period. And so that is part of her, her experience that she then passes on in writing uh, literature in the late 19th century, early 20th century. So, I am happy now to take Q and A. Um, if we want to to go there, and so um, the the question of whether women of color were able to maintain. I'm just now looking at the ones that are in here. I'll answer these first. Um, the Yes, some women of color were able to maintain ownership. Uh, that met Madame Pelagie Rutger is one to look into her story to uh, understand, to get a good example of that. Um, the reading and books, more freedom tied to the merchant background of the city. Yeah, the French background, like just the culture. And with French, they they tended to bring a lot of books with them. Um, and so, and we had a library really early in St. Louis and that early library in the 1820s, 1830s, we see advertisements for it appealing to women and saying, and they're saying, you know, they were wanting women to come use the library. We also have, um, a, a, in the 1830s, we have a public statement in the newspaper saying women, women, men, like anyone of any color, of any race can come to the library, as long as they're not disturbing the library. It's really funny. Like the way it's worded is really kind of funny from a library, from a modern perspective, because it says as long as you, um, you have to like pay the librarian or you pay them for their time or something like that. But anyone is welcome to come into this library. So uh, it's a really interesting um, thing. And there are really good resources out there. Uh, there were several people that did inventories of those libraries. So you can, and you can find those online. There's one that's a, an inventory of Creole libraries in St. Louis, the title of it. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's something that you can look into and learning more about these libraries. Um, is there any information of Esther's descendants? Yes, because they're Clay Morgan des descendants as well. There is a whole book written about the Clay Morgans. They are going to go on to have a very complicated story um, because Jacques Clay Morgan was very light skinned. And so the children that he had, some of them are very light skinned, some are very dark skinned. And so that's going to play out, right, as their family goes on and that money passes through as to who's able to who's able to move into society in different ways. And the book, The Colored Aristocracy of St. Louis, is written by one of his descendants. And that it's an incredible firsthand, basically this 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 guy is just walking through St. Louis, pointing at houses, 
and telling you like the business of the people inside. It's very interesting, like saying this woman is not allowed to be in society this year because she said something wrong at church or like it's a really um, casual, but also really uh, useful source when looking at this time period in St. Louis and these experiences. Wonderful. Um, I think you might have gotten to all there was four from what I saw. So you might have, I don't know if you hit them all. Uh, the books, the book, were any women of color able to maintain ownership of the land, the descendants, and then the census information? Wonderful. Um, if there are any additional questions, feel free to throw those in the Q&A and or the chat. But I did have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, you gave an excellent uh, presentation. Thank you for all of the additional information. And I know we are joined by teachers, you know, ranging grade levels. I guess, how would you take some of this information that you presented today and what kind of advice would you give for you know educators to incorporate it in their classrooms? That's a great question. Um, as I hesitate to, to, I can only answer it as a public historian and not an educator. Um, I am always quickly humbled at work um, in my job as a, as a public historian, very quickly humbled when I'm helping the educators out because their job is infinitely more complex and amazing um to to rest to get this information in one place but um to me what really works with this topic is leaning into the challenge to what you expect and and that that whole border idea really um really people love like yeah they, they really love that and, and sitting with that and because it continues to be a border right not just during empire but during uh prior to emancipation it's a border prior to uh railroads crossing it it's this weird this is very interesting place that we that we are in hopefully that answer i know i didn't like give a specific no, one that but i am good. i'm seeding <laughs> seeding honor and and respect to the job yeah no thank you and i think a lot of those types of questions to, to ponder and to think about it you know ranging kind of like grade levels is, is excellent and also too you provided a lot of like primary sources and that's excellent to drive conversation as well and so I think that the teachers will find that very helpful as well. Thanks. Uh, there's a question in here about um, my information being gathered from census yes. land document and filling mm -hmm. the blanks with storytelling. I um, as a public historian I am someone who gathers secondary sources. I'm really good at it um, and that's something I am not a, I'm not someone who I don't I'm not writing those primaries, or right, I'm not doing that scholarly work. Um, I am, I am in the world, the study of sharing history and and putting that together. But there is great scholarly work on this. Uh, I think we we shared some of that beforehand. Um, there's a lot of really good like people have done their dissertations and things on this topic that have really great bibliographies that um, are easy to get to that information. Wonderful. I'm still kind of clicking. Oh. Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, I have it says I have a class from Leanne. I have a class of 26 girls. I'm just so impressed with the power women had back then. Definitely something we could talk about. Women have always been held back in the past. So yeah, no, I think that a lot of this information is great conversation starters for students to really start digging down and thinking about um, you know, the role that women played um in Missouri at this time. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. All right. Well, if there are not any other questions, don't want to just hold everybody. Oh, Rob threw one in there. Okay. <laughs> How do you balance talking about power and agency versus limitations? Ooh. Um, that's a great question. And I think, I mean, I think it's just every now and then being able to touch back on that, even if these things are true, or like two things can be true at once, right? And these things can be true, but at the end of the day, this is true, right? Like like the whole thing of, you know, women could do this, 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 this. At the end of the day, though, they are the legal property of their husband, <laughs> like if they're married, right? Um, so just touching touching back on that is, for me, how I balance when I'm sharing this information because it's so easy to run away with it and get this really romantic, rosy, oh my gosh, they're all of it. And we got it every now and then pull it back. Um, but also respect the experiences of people that that did have, you know, took took advantage of that agency that they had um in different ways. Wonderful. All right. 
Well, thank you again so much for the amazing presentation. We really appreciate yeah. it, Amanda. Um, and I will let everybody go. <laughs> I hope everyone have a good night. Thanks for coming to me. Bye, everyone. Bye.